Hey, everybody. <laughs> Welcome to the finely tuned and highly polished best of build. Developer velocity is what we're talking about in this segment. Uh, I'm Burke. I'm Anthony. That's, Anthony. That's Anthony. Oh, did you know the camera's a mirror image? I just not realized that. You're looking did at you yourself. Why aren't you looking at me? Well, Come on. First, I think we should define developer velocity before we go any further with this dumpster fire. And I believe the proper definition is the, the maximum speed that a developer has when leaping off of a tall building, right? The maximum speed before you hit the ground would be developer velocity. That's how I understand it. How do you understand it? Yeah, that's that's about right. And then if it's a tall enough building, then you hit terminal velocity. And then that's that's, that's when you kind of hit the point in your career where you can't go any faster. Right. And that's me. I'm already at terminal velocity. Or actually, I've already hit the, I've already hit the ground, as is evidenced by this live stream. All right, folks, we do have some great content for you today. This is the best to build, a wrap up of all the developer centric things that happened at build. There was a lot that happened, not just during build, but some of it happened prior to build. And it was kind of like, shh, we kind of announced it, but didn't say much. And then there was some things that we actually announced after build and also kind of didn't say much. And so what we're gonna do is give you all of those things together, the before, the build, and the after, starting with something that we launched actually prior to build. Actually, the first week in May, it was kind of hush-hush. We didn't make that big of a deal about it, or did we, Anthony? I thought it was a pretty big deal, but maybe, maybe not everyone knew about it. Uh, so uh, in the middle of May, we actually announced the um, GA of Azure Static Web Apps. So it's a service that um, we can use to deploy full stack serverless web apps. And um, so you can kind of see on my screen here all the things that they can do. Um, we can take your kind of your front end app that, you know, whether it's built with React or Angular or something like Blazor, um, as well as you know, any serverless APIs built with Azure Functions. We'll integrate it with GitHub or uh, Azure DevOps, and we'll deploy this, um, your, your content all over the world. Um, as well as your, your your functions all at the same time. So it's really easy to kind of get going. And, um, and one of the things that we announced at, um, at, at the GA is a new um, standard plan. So um, so when we kind of were, were going through the, the, the preview, um, we had a free plan and that free plan is staying around. So, um, so if you had a site deployed to the free plan or, you, or if you want to deploy a site for free, um, you can deploy it um, forever for free. Um, and what we added is a standard plan. So if you want to have you know, um, an SLA or to, to be able to go over the 100 gigabytes per month in bandwidth, as well as get access to some, some other kind of features that, that are exclusive to the standard plan. Um, you, yeah, like the, the, the standard plan is there for you now, but the free plan is totally capable, supports things like custom domains, including another kind of like new feature, which is a support for Apex domains, which is something that I know you've been asking for, Burke. Yeah, for like four years. So question, why is this a big deal? Um, because we have app service. We've had app service. I assume app service is still around. And we, for a while, we're encouraging people to put their static apps. And by static, we mean front-end driven. So React, Angular, Vue, Blazor, anything which sort of has a build step and then generates some output for you. We call those static web apps. But we were putting those on storage for a while. And now there's an entirely new service why yeah so what we found was that um for app service it's actually more than what you need um quite often you're deploying you know like an asp.net or a node express or some other app there that actually needs a needs an app service to run and it's something that's running all the time um and, but you know and 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 then you know deploying to for to storage um you have to kind of put a lot of stuff together yourself whether it's um you know putting a cdn on top or setting up your domains and all that stuff. All that stuff you kind of have to do yourself. And a lot of folks will still want to go this route because um, they want full control. Um, but what we're kind of finding is that uh, a new emerging pattern um, that some folks call the jam stack, where you kind of have this really fast, you know, mostly pre-compiled website that's all static files um, that also connect to some serverless endpoints or some kind of data source in the cloud. Um, and we wanted to kind of build a service that's totally catered to that. Um, really kind of like Git centric as well, so that you know when you, we can de de deploy straight from your Git repo in GitHub or Azure DevOps, and soon you know in other places as well. Yeah. So, uh, producer, if you want to go ahead and throw my screen up, we can actually take a look at a static web app here, one that we've got deployed 
And uh, here's the URL. Let me just, let's click on this. Do I need to control click? Oh no, we get a new screen here. I'm going to back out of this a little bit. But you'll notice there was a bit of a delay there while it was re getting some data from the database. It's kind of simple. It is built with React. We can log in, go through an auth flow here where we're granting consent. And all of this is powered by static web apps. And if I was in the right role, I would be able to do a new blog post, but I'm not. And so the the kind of cool thing about static web apps that these other services like App Service and um, Storage didn't do, although App Service kind of does this now with the new deployment center, is that when you create this, it generates an actions file for you. So it's actually in the, the repo here in the workflows. Oh, and my browser is locked up. It's been doing this recently. Um, but you get a you get a workflow file, an actions file, and then it automatically deploys your app. It does the build and the deployment. So you check into GitHub and it takes care of sort of the CI CD, which is kind of like the magic behind the scenes. Uh, and then there's this idea of having Azure Functions as the API for these things. Uh, and the reason for that is that Functions are particularly well suited for APIs because it's easy to stand up HTTP endpoints and because serverless is cheap, if not darn near free, right? And so there's sort of a cost element here and then there's the lightweight element. And so the way that we do this is um, if we have a project like this one here, the application itself, and we'll give you the source code for this, this little blog app, but the source code itself sits inside of uh, a project, and this is just a, a React project, right? So I just did create React app, and then this is what it gave me, aside from this API folder, but just hold on to that for a second. And then inside of there, we have the React app. So if you if you do React, this looks familiar to you. Uh, if you don't, that doesn't, but you can imagine Angular or Vue or something else here instead. And then by adding an API folder, we sort of allow you to embed an Azure Functions project inside of your application and define some endpoints. And so historically, the problem has been here is that you can run the front end, uh, which we could do with like, um, like, let's just, I tell you what, let's just start over. Let's just delete these terminals here. All right, so you could start this with um, npm start. And that would start the front end. Let me close this starts the React little React development server. And then it's running on localhost 3000. So if we click on this, it's up, but it's not pulling any data in because we haven't started the API. So we have to start that too. So we can do that from here, attached to node functions. And again, this is all configured for you when you create the, uh, the static web app. But now we have our functions running. And if you've used functions before, this looks familiar. And now we want to call these endpoints from this application. But but the problem is that, how do you do that? Um, so for instance, if we're calling for our posts, which I think happens over here in post, we're doing a fetch at the very start here, slash API. But these two things are running in two separate places, right? The, the front end's running on localhost 3000, and the back end's running on localhost 7071 here. And so if we refresh, this doesn't work. And if we actually look at the network requests here, like we can look when it calls for posts here, it's just it's just returning the actual application itself, right? Because React doesn't know what it, it doesn't know this URL, this slash API means nothing to React. And so we need a way for this to run locally the same way that it does when you put it in static web apps. Because in static web apps, we map this API folder for you. So when you call slash API, you actually get your functions endpoints. And so to do that, we introduced a new tool called the static web apps CLI, which you can get from uh, NPM. So just install it like this, which we won't do again. And then, uh, and then you can start this thing uh, hold on, there we go. So just do uh, SWA start. And then you can see I'm specifying localhost 3000 and then the folder for the API. And I, my API is already running, so I actually don't know what will happen if I do this. Oh, it just fires right up. And then let's click on this URL here. 
And now we get the blog and we get the content, right? And so if you look at the network requests, let's refresh, and we look at posts, posts here. So you can see it's the same sort of request response here, right? Slash API slash post, but the response is actually the function content, which is what we want. So that was one of the new things that we introduced was the emulator, which runs locally, which helps you to develop locally the same way that you could do, uh, say the same way that it would run when you actually put it in production. All right, anything I missed there, Anthony? Uh, no, I thought I was doing this demo, but that's uh, that, that was great. Oh, were you? <laughs> Which one was I doing? All the rest. <laughs> what are the rest? <laughs> There's other demos? Yeah, don't worry. We're, 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 yeah, don't worry, people. We're professionals here. We know what we're yeah, doing. We're, it's where it's very rehearsed. That was actually a fantastic demo. More than like better than I would have done. So thank you very much. So what else does the static web, web, web apps emulator do for people? Um, so there's a couple more things. Um, I can kind of quickly quickly show you something yeah, on, on my side as well. So to, get, to grab the static web app CLI, like Brooke said, you can just install it from NPM. Um, so it also works with Blazor apps as well. So I have a Blazor app here um, in my VS Code. Um, I have both a an API and an app folder. So that's the two parts of my static web app. And I can actually set it up so that I can press F5 and start this app, both the front end and the back end, and actually attach the buggers to both the um, C Sharp Azure Functions app, as well as the Blazor app that's running in the, in, in the browser. So all the functionality that you showed, Burke, um, is available to my Blazor app locally. Um, so hopefully this starts up here in a sec. You can see it's kind of busy doing stuff in the background. But here's my Blazor app. Um, I can really quickly log in, um, like uh, simulate the login, and then um, log into my app. And now you can see that I have this fetch data thing that I didn't have before. And that's because the auth is working locally. And if I click fetch data, um, what's happening is that I'm hitting a breakpoint. In this case, I'm hitting the breakpoint in my um, in my back end. And for some reason, it's not hitting the front end one. So I'll just uh, uncheck that and check it again. And then if I go and hit this again, you can see that it's actually hitting the front end breakpoint as well. So this is C Sharp running in the browser, and I'm hitting a breakpoint in there. And then if I have five on that, now it hits the breakpoint in my function app as well. So really nice kind of local development experience um, when you tie it together with, uh, with Visual Studio Code. So I have a couple of questions here. The first one is, I feel like you intentionally made me look bad by setting everything up underneath an F5, which isn't fair. I don't feel like I was properly warned about that. And so mine had like nine steps, yours had one. So I'm angry about that. Also, I've noticed that your sidebar is on the wrong side. I couldn't help but notice that it's on the left and should be on the right. Again, yeah. I'm not judging you, except for it's on the wrong side. And then thirdly, for Blazor, do I understand correctly that that's all running in the browser? So that's C Sharp running in the browser? Yep, this is C Sharp running in the browser. We're loading the DLLs into the browser and actually executing them there. Isn't that, isn't that against the Geneva Conventions or no? Do I have that wrong? No, you got the old rules. Oh, like those are the, the old rules. Are okay. Right. Yeah, that's right. So, yeah. Uh, question though, and I would like to know from people, are people doing C Sharp in VS Code? Is that a thing? Do a lot of people write C Sharp in VS Code? Or is it mostly Visual? I do. Um, I, I do. I probably split my time between VS Code and Visual Studio, really depending on uh, and what I use. So later on, if we have time, we can actually look at you know, Visual Studio 2022 as well. Um, yeah, near, near the end of the show. So And Shane Boyer said yes, capital yes. OK, cool. I'm just asking, Shane, is your sidebar also on the wrong side? Is this, uh, is this problem endemic with everybody? I actually don't think it's on the wrong side. I think, you know, like you were saying in the beginning that everything's reverse in your video. I think you're just seeing everything backwards. Oh, okay. That's probably what it is. Okay. Yeah. Moving right along. Let's talk about something that we didn't talk about at build at all. How about that? Yeah. We're only going to get this content here. This is special content. Yeah. Okay. So whenever Anthony, you want to look at a GitHub repo, how, what, do, what are the steps that you have to take to open that repo? inside of VS Code? Well, yeah, typically if I plan to make edits, I probably need to like fork it first, and then I gotta click the little button, I gotta copy the URL, I gotta paste in my terminal, I have to go git clone, I have to CD into the folder. Wait, 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 type... you forgot the step where it tells you that that authentication failed. 
and that <sighs> your password didn't work because you don't have your yeah. SSH key set up correctly. <laughs> well, just, yeah. I have a really simple password set up, so that's not a problem for me. It's just password it's, one, two, three. It's and then literally like, every time for me. I cannot fix that problem and make it go away permanently. Yeah, it's, well, <laughs> that might be a problem exclusive to you, Burke. But It is a problem um, exclusive to me. Listen, I have copied so many commands from Stack Overflow and pasted them mindlessly in my terminal, and nothing is working. <laughs> Please send help. All right, so right after build... We launched something new for VS Code, and this is so exclusive. This is remote repositories. So let's talk about that. Visual Studio Code has been investing a lot in what we call remote development. And there's a couple of different ways that you can do remote development today. One of them is that you can just do remote into WSL, which you can see I'm a producer. I don't know if my screen's showing, but just an audio double check there. I'm actually remoted into my WSL on Windows. Okay, so that's one way. Another way is that you can remote into an SSH connection and do a virtual machine. So you can actually develop like you're on the machine without having to use remote desktop and have your mouse cursor be like two seconds behind everywhere you drag it. Okay, so that's the other one. A third one that you can do is remote called remote containers. And that's where you spin up a Docker container and develop inside of that. I'm going to be a little late to that meeting, I think. And then the fourth one that we released, and this is actually from GitHub, is something called Remote Repositories. So what you want to do is install this extension called Remote Repositories. Let's look at that. Um, you'll see, I think there's two of them here. Uh, one of them says Insiders. You just want this Remote Repositories. And you know you got the right one because it says GitHub. And while we're at it, because I know people are going to ask this question, the theme that I'm using here is is the GitHub theme, and it's called Dark Dimmed. Okay, so let's just get that, get that out of the way because I know that question's coming. All right, so this remote repositories extension, what does this do? Okay, so we talked about how you would normally get a repository open in VS Code. Remote remote repositories is sort of a different way to do that same thing. So what we would do is open the command palette, or you can actually click down here, and we can look for open remote repository in this menu. And then when we do that, it wants to know, uh, OK, where? And so we're going to say from GitHub. And then now I can just choose a repository. So I'm going to sort of filter here like this. Um, and oh, that's right. I've got a, I have an issue on mine, probably the same login issue. I'll tell you what, let's find a GitHub repo. Like, um, let's see here. Let's go github.com. Then let's do, let's do uh, so here's one, Sunrise Standup, which is a, a demo that we did for build. So if we wanted to open this, we can just come here and say, uh, open remote repository. And then it automatically pastes that in there because it knows that's on my clipboard. Then I'm going to hit Enter. And what's going to happen here is it's going to open this project in VS Code. But I don't have this project locally, right? So I never did a clone. That just didn't happen. Um, and then when it comes up, you'll notice that we get this restricted mode uh, uh, dialog. So there's a banner at the top. It says restricted mode is intended for safe code browsing. And then there's it's down here again. And you'll actually see this for any repository that you open, whether it's remote repositories or you do it locally. And this is something called uh, trusted workspaces. And we'll talk about this in a minute, but you're going to see this from now on all the time. And you may wonder, why is it telling me this? And we'll talk about that. Uh, but for remote repositories here, you can see that we're now connected to GitHub. And we're looking at, it says, some features are not available for resources located on a virtual file system. So what does that mean? Well, what this means is that we don't actually have this project cloned locally. Okay, We're looking at it directly on GitHub through the window of VS Code. How does that work? Well, for a long time, VS Code has had this thing called the File System Provider API. And what you can do is you can map that provider to uh, your API, in this case, the GitHub API. And that gives us what we call a virtual file system. So let's look through some of these. You can see as I expand, I don't know if you saw that, but it actually takes just a half second the first time because it's actually pulling the stuff in from the API. And then if I open this file here, this is all us just 
talking to the GitHub API over the internet, right? Not local. I don't have these files cloned. And I can see all of the code and I can browse it, right? So a lot of the stuff that I would do locally in VS Code still works in remote repositories. So for instance, like it knows because VS Code knows about the JavaScript API, it knows about fetch, right? And it can give us IntelliSense there. But it doesn't know about our code. So for instance, like, um, so this use effect is a common React thing, right? So if we do use effect here, and then we hit the parens, right? There's no IntelliSense for us there because this actually comes from the React NPM package. And in GitHub, you don't put your NPM packages in GitHub, so they're not, unless you're me 10 years ago, and then you do it with every project and people scream at you. Uh, but it doesn't know about your code because it can't inspect your files. So generally, what is this good for? Well, it's good for um, browsing GitHub repos very quickly. Uh, it's good for making quick changes, specifically if you're doing Markdown, right? So if you wanted to come in and make some change here, you know, you get the nice Markdown preview. That looks good. You can make the change. And then what's kind of important to note here is that since you are editing on GitHub, if you click Save, you'll see over here in the side that we have one change to the README file. And we can stage this, right? Um, update the README. And then we can commit it. But if we do this, just like if we're actually editing this file on GitHub, it's automatically saved, right? So there's no push. Normally, you'd come down here and say push. There is no push, right? You're already on GitHub. And actually, you don't even have to save this file. As soon as you make the changes, they're reflected here, right? And then you can just go ahead and commit. So it's really good for very quick uh, editing on GitHub as well. And then the last one is that it's very good for reviewing pull requests. Uh, one of the options that you may have seen here, so let's go ahead and close this remote workspace and then open one. So one of the options here is to, uh, let's see here. Oh, it's activating, give it a second. One of the options that we should have here is to uh, open a pull request here from GitHub, right? And then we could find a repo and open a pull request on that repo uh, and then review it right here in re remote repositories. So for instance, like somebody added React DOM to my simple React snippet. So let's just open this, right? We're just gonna look at this pull request. That's all we're doing. And again, I don't have this local. We're just looking at it directly on GitHub. Uh, and then it should, let's see. Yeah, we're on the feature import React DOM here. Uh, and then we could examine this pull request and see uh, what the actual changes are here and jump directly to the PR. And uh, this is from February. I probably should get on this. So that's, <laughs> sorry, sorry, folks. They only reminded you three times. This is the beauty of open source. You make something and then you just forget about it and don't do anything else. Uh, and everybody. <laughs> I think that person, that, that person's already forked a repo and now theirs is the official one. It's terrible. I should not be allowed to do open source. I'm the worst maintainer of all time. Okay, let's talk about something else here, uh, which we talked about a little bit, which was, um, let's do, what's one we can do that I haven't been in before? Uh, let's go into Shane's folder here. Uh, yeah, this is a tool that we use internally. I'm going to open this and hopefully, hopefully, hopefully I haven't trusted this yet. And it will give us, yeah, here we go. Okay, so this is what, this is what I wanted to get because I want to show you this because a lot of people are seeing this now and they're like, what is this? Why are you asking? You've never asked me this before. Why are you asking me this? Okay, so the deal is in VS Code, when you clone a project and you open it, there's all sorts of stuff that runs in VS Code, right? You might have extensions that are running, right? It might kick off, it might execute a node process. It might execute some code in the project locally. And so that's just a massive security vector that you don't necessarily want to have wide open, which is the way that it's been, All right? And so now what we're saying is we're asking, do you trust, it's basically <laughs> saying, do you trust the person that wrote this code? And because it's Shane Boyer, no, I don't. I don't trust Shane. I have no idea what he's been up to. And so I'm going to say, no, I don't trust the authors. Okay, so what happens if we do that? So restricted mode is now on. And if we go to manage, it'll tell us a little bit more about this. It's called workspace trust. 
So it says you're in restricted mode, right? And in a trusted folder, you can do these things, which is basically everything. In restricted mode, tasks are disabled, debugging is disabled. There are 23 settings that VS Code has said could be a security problem with this project, so we're not going to enable those, and 62 extensions that it's just disabled, <laughs> right? Uh, okay. The fact that you have 20, <laughs> that you have 62 installed. It's oh, I have way more than that. I have like 620. Uh, and then if we wanted to change that, we can just go ahead and say trust here, and then workspace trust has been granted, right? Now, one of the things that you can do here is you can come back, like, let's open this again. And I don't think it's going to ask us again because we've already told it to trust. Yeah, it's not going to ask us again. But one of the things that you can do when it asks you is it will say, do you want to trust everything that's in this folder, right? In other words, everything that's in the parent folder, SP Boyer, do you want to trust that? And if you say yes, then it just never asks you again for, for anything that you put in that folder from here on out. So for your folder, in my case, that's, you know, Burr Collins. If I open anything in this, so let's do um, what is API. I don't even know what this folder has in it. I think I've already set it for this folder, and it shouldn't ask me about it. Oh, it does. So let's see here. Um, it looks, where's the checkbox? I feel like the checkbox to trust the entire folder has been gone. Uh, okay, so it's in there somewhere. I'm not exactly sure where, but those are the trusted workspace setting. I have to go find it now. Those are the trusted workspace settings. And if you use VS Code, you're going to see that. No, it's not just you. It's something that's new. Uh, we hope that you will opt into uh, to opening your projects in a trusted environment if you're, if you're not sure the first time you open them. But besides just, you know, sort of blindly trusting everything opt into a trusted workspace setting and then go to uh, or, or opt into safe workspace settings and then opt into trusted once you feel like you're good to go. Those yep, are the safety first. Workspace. Always. Okay, I feel like I'm doing all the talking. Why don't you do some talking? All right, uh, we can uh, spend a couple minutes talking about some new features in Visual Studio. How about we probably that? should do that. The Visual Studio people are going to be mad. They're not going to be mad. They're nice people. Um, <laughs> They're going to be mad so, at you, not me. Oh yeah, yeah that's that's true. Um, so so yeah, let's let's get to it then. Uh, so yeah, so Visual Studio 20, uh, 20, 2022 was announced at Build and actually just came out a, like a few days ago in in, in preview one. So um, if you all haven't checked it out yet, go ahead and download it and try it out. So there's some kind of new stuff in it. Um, one of the big ones is actually Visual Studio twenty twenty two is now sixty four bit. Um, this might not sound like it's um, it's it's that important, but it's 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 twice as many bits as before. And, uh, <laughs> and uh, wait, 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 what does that do for me as a developer? Does, do I get to open files that are twice as big? Like, what is the yeah. advantage? Yeah, so you can actually open like ginormous projects now. You can actually see this little video here where they're actually opening up a solution that's got 1,600 projects in it. Um, I, I don't know how somebody would have this what, many projects why, today why? in the solution but but now it's able to do that and it's, it's able to do that super super fast because it's uh, it can go over the six uh, sorry, the, the four gigabytes of memory that uh, the 32-bit apps um have access to wow so just load every project you've ever written in visual studio at once it's yeah fun. so this person just basically just get cloned all of github and they <laughs> opened it so that, that's kind of how it works. Um, there's some stuff uh, with like uh, inclusive design as well, like um, giving you insights into accessibility. Um, you know, .NET MAUI is a thing, so you can actually build an app once and have it run on iOS, Mac OS, Android, Windows. I don't know what else I missed. Wait, isn't that Xamarin? Also, it is, but it's, it's kind of like the next generation or the, the next, you know, the iteration of it. Um, and then one kind of like final thing that uh, that or not one final thing, but one one additional thing that I thought was super interesting is um, this thing called like IntelliCode that's built into v VS twenty twenty two as well. So I'll just kind of quickly show you this. This is like literally just a project that I created, um, and I added a class called Person. And then I'm like, you know, usually I would just be like, you know, you know, this person has an ID or whatever, but it's actually going to like recommend me that I, I just type this code. So I just hit, hit, hit tab, and it's like, what else do I need next? Oh, maybe this person needs a oh. name. Yeah, and then I just keep going that, and it's like okay. So like you know, all the you know hard work of coding before, um, you no longer have to do this. You just have to just keep hitting tab and enter. Um, and it's actually quite smart as well. So I've actually changed this to like say if I had to type first name here, um, what do you think is going to recommend? 
uh, last name. Yeah, so it's actually gonna my current last name. So it's actually learned from like many many projects that's in GitHub, and um, you know using the power of AI. So AI is everywhere, and it's actually really kind of you know making it much easier to code. Um, I can write an entire app now just by pressing Enter and Tab. That's pretty cool. Uh, I know that IntelliCode also works really well. So the the most applicable use case for this for JavaScript or TypeScript is that it'll format your dates for you, which is a huge nightmare in JavaScript. I don't know if it's the same way in .NET, but IntelliCode does that, which is kind of rad. Like you can just type out, I want it the, the format to look like this, like May 10th, 2021, and it will put the format code in there for you, which is rad. Yeah, that's awesome. Okay. Um, so yeah, we're coming close to time. Um, do we want to kind of just talk about where we can get um, the links from all the stuff we shared today? Yeah, kind of producer, up? do you have our our call to action, as they say in the biz? Uh, I don't. I think it's supposed to be down at the bottom. I don't know. If not, if you can just read it out, Burke. Nope. Dimitri's like, no, I don't. That's that's on you. Uh, can I change? Watch this. Watch this. So just do this. Watch my name. So go to the urls.com slash best of build. Right now it's on my, now it's there. Okay. Easy peasy. And you'll have all the links to everything that we talked about. There's a good wrap up blog post on the visual studio code blogs that has all of the sessions. Yeah, there it is. Man, Dimitri's on it. Anything from yeah. on your side, Anthony, that you want people to know about specifically? Uh, no, I think we talked about everything. All the links are on that page. Okay, that's it. That's it. We're out of time, and they're never going to have us back. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think I think that was for, for certain within two minutes of us starting this stream. Right. When everybody dropped. Okay. <laughs> what do we do now? You just take us off the air permanently? Yeah, I think we just disappear. 